All right, all right. Today is episode 127, and today I have Kevin Vistason from the Deer Hunter podcast on to honestly talk about anything and everything. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Welcome to the Fall Podcast. I am your host, Aaron Blasey, and this is episode 127. I have not gotten an episode out in a couple weeks. I apologize for that. Some people are writing in saying, "Hey, where's I? I need my I need I need my, my podcast fix for this week." And I apologize to everybody, but life has got me. But I see the light at the end of the tunnel. My house is finally sold, closed on. We moved out. Done with that. My daughter's still in a cast. She'll be getting that off soon. But today, uh, I had Kevin Vistason on. Kevin, him and I have become buddies over the last couple of years through podcasts, you know, through social media. Um, he's a good dude. A good dude. He's putting out great, great content on his podcast, the Deer Hunter podcast. He's another Michigan guy. Um, honestly, this one's a long one, but it's 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 it was needed. Him and I have been kind of bullshitting over the phone in the last little while. You know, we talk on the phone every once in a while, and, and we're like, you know what, let's get on a podcast and do it. And and we talk about a lot of shit in this one, man. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. It's it's a fun one, and it's all over the map, but we stay on track. Um, you know, honestly, I hit record when I called him, and we just started kind of bullshitting, and I thought we were going to just like kind of, you know, eventually get into it, and then we were like, you know what? let's just roll that last 18 to 20 minutes and just go with it. So we're going to come in hot with this one right out of the gate, uh, talking about guns, talking about, you know, anything and everything. So a little different, but Hey, I'm good with it. Let's roll with it. Um, a couple notes on my end, Justin and I have been busy. Then all get out. He's got stuff going on right now. Nothing bad. All good. Um, in Iowa, he's trying to get things ready to go. He's in between hunts. He's actually on a hunt right now uh, in Colorado, another elk hunt. So he's actually not on. When he gets back, we'll be doing an update on his endeavors that he's been on. But um, it's getting close to deer season here in Michigan. It's been colder than cold, you know, than we're used to. It's been low 50s the last couple days. Kind of rainy, but I'm telling you. It's it's getting to be that that time, and I'm excited. I cannot wait for October 1st to be here, as of you know everybody that hasn't hunted yet. But I mean, there's guys in Kentucky, Wyoming, Nebraska knocking down giants right now, and I love seeing it. And uh, we got a full slate of people coming up here on the podcast and trying to get back on schedule for every week. Um, I'm actually recording this intro for my truck because everybody's in the house sleeping. So a little different situation than my old house. So um, just bear with me. We'll get back on track here. So appreciate you guys writing in and asking questions and, uh, you know, and all the downloads. I mean, you guys are awesome. The support is through the roof, climbing. We're, We're breaking our own records of downloads, you know, per month, per week, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's unbelievable that all you guys want to hear my stupid voice <laughs> talk about, you know, just nonsense and whitetails, but I love it. I appreciate it. Um, I don't know how many times I can say that, but th- there it is. I appreciate it. I appreciate everything. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to get over this interview that Kevin and I, you know, just recorded. So, um, hope you guys enjoy it and, uh, you know, good luck this fall. Yeah, let's do that. Let's get in. I mean, we're we're 18 minutes into this thing, so let's. There, oh, there dude, some, we're firing on all cylinders. We are, we are. It's great. I, I will. I do want to say one thing first to you. Congratulations on the new baby coming. But I, I do want to say you didn't really you time it very well. <laughs> yeah. No. Well. <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, let's see how that worked out. Actually, it was uh, Valentine's Day weekend. Right. Oh, sure. There's that sure. the yep. meme, the meme that goes around that says, you know, be careful what you do. And I was never much for listening, so here we are. <laughs> That's awesome, though, man. <laughs> Baby number two, and it's a little girl, right? Yeah, for sure, man. My son's five. We uh, neighbor boy came over here today, 
we shot bows after work. A uh, neighbor boy had never shot a real bow, and my kid's been shooting a bow for a minute now. He's got a little recurve. I cut some arrows down for his his length and got got some heavy FOC going on them for him. So they're actually flying pretty good, and he's been shooting for like a year now. And the neighbor boy came over here, and we shot. So yeah, we got we're got getting into like the family archery stuff now and we got basically the final piece to our little family puzzle uh you know we're, we're having our daughter i'm just counting the days down man <laughs> i want i can't wait to get through like there's obviously been a lot of stress with uh work and politics and everything over the last couple of months and then obviously I, i'm a plumber by trade and work in the hospitals and i worked in the hospitals through the entire covid thing mind you with my wife being pregnant and having a little kid here at home and not having any idea right up front where all that was and what was going on. But I mean, that's how I make my money. So right. um, there was a giant influx of people into the hospitals, which put a lot of stress on all the utilities. So I was working crazy right in direct patient rooms through the whole COVID thing and my wife's being pregnant. And uh, it has just been a stressful last couple months on this household and we are like beyond excited to get this baby here get her healthy for sure i mean you get a lot you get you come to realize man i'm in my uh, upper 30s right now and uh, i'm i'm really really like seeing the value in life and children and family and uh man uh you you know about the timing and everything it was just kind of like uh yeah, it's less than ideal, but I, I'm honestly excited about the fact that I have to do things differently because yep. I'll often fall into, um, I kind of have my pattern in the fall. Yep. And this breaks my pattern, so I got to do some things differently. And I mean, I don't, you know, on my list of priorities right now, deer hunting is real kind of far down them in comparison to like getting this baby here, getting her healthy and get through that. And that said, trust me, when we get past that point, like you and I were already talking about some late season deer hunting. I like me some late season deer hunting <laughs> and I should have the opportunity to do that. So, uh, it actually potentially is going to hold me probably back from bombarding some spots that I should leave alone that I don't. And come that late season, the right days, right conditions, and get in there with that, you know, bow or muzzle loader. Oh man, I'll be chomping at the bit. I don't disagree at all, man, because you know, I, I've got one daughter, she's three, and you know, we've you and I have kind of talked a little bit the last couple of weeks and uh there's been a lot going on in our life too, just you know, other than my my wife's a an a nurse, an RN, so she's, you know, at the forefront of all this COVID has been at the beginning, you know. So our lives have changed just in the fact of like how she treats, you know, takes care of herself to not come home to us, you know, and maybe transmit, you know, something to us and everything like that. So our life's changed that way. But on top of that, we've through some added stress on i mean we sold our house as of yesterday our house is closed on we don't own it anymore we've moved um temporarily till we start building next spring but then my daughter just turned three you know three weeks ago and then a couple days before her birthday or like a week before her birthday she broke her femur at daycare so she's in a cast our life has changed even more she's got like two weeks left in this cast so she's she'll be you know she's been down for like six weeks so we're just, I mean, ready to kind of get back in somewhat a groove and how you were saying, like, it's kind of kept you out of the woods and like maybe helped you a little bit. That's kind of where I'm at. I'm at this year too, is like, I, I told you I, earlier, I, I went and pulled a camera for the first time in three months. I mean, usually I'm like, <laughs> want to pull those cameras all summer and everything three months, man. And, and on that farm, it's my one acre farm. I, my track record last couple of years, I've got good deer that are always on there. Now, will they stick around? Usually one will stick around. This year, I haven't really had a shooter buck all all summer on it. And I, I was kind of talking to my wife the other day about it. I was like, you know what? I feel like once this velvet comes off and that transition happens, like I feel like something's going to move in. 
You know, something will call it home. It happens every year, but usually it happens before this. I pulled that card today, man, and something moved in, and I'm super stoked about it. I mean, he's he's a he's a ten point. Um, I figure him probably like at 120, 125. He might surprise you once you get him on the ground, possibly. But his body is so big. Uh, I, I feel like he's probably a three and a half year old deer, but never seen the deer before in my life. He showed up on the 24th of August and then he came back on the 31st and then the 1st of September and he was still velvet on the 1st of September and then um, he is hard horn on the 7th. So we're recording this on the 9th. Two days ago he was hard horn. So, and he's in daylight. Um, so I think a lack of pressure on my part on the farm has really helped because the deer feel from the from the looks of the camera the deer are really calm right now so i can i can agree to what you're talking about i was going to take up basket weaving this summer <laughs> and just to kind of keep my myself occupied but uh other things have been keeping me occupied so nice dude yeah normally i usually have uh, just because i run quite a few cameras i probably run last year i probably ran 10 cameras which actually turns out to be quite a bit of work if you don't have a very good system. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, but I, I got a fairly good system. Now, I, I will be honest, right now, I'm just getting to where I, I think I need to deploy my cameras. Because, like you were talking about that buck moving in, everything basically prior from now, for me in the past, no trail camera data has ever helped me kill a deer and for what cameras cost and my only seem to get ants in them or just it beats them up being out there right so i used to run cameras all year and after doing that for like two or three seasons i was just like this is uh, a ton of work for really no gain i'm not seeing a lot of return on on this and i broke down basically what I entailed to be useful information. And it starts about now, I think for here, for us in Michigan, because everybody heads into the woods and it changes everything and all the food sources change. And so all for the most part, a ton of deer move around, at least in the spots that I, you know, that I have hunted historically down here in the South Maybe not so much up north, but honestly, the bear hunters on the dogs through up there. And I mean, that really changes the deer up a lot, too. I've 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 learned quite a bit about uh, bear and bear hunters, how they affect deer up north, too. Uh, It's probably the biggest thing that gets those patterns changed for them up years. But I usually have a few good deer on camera. And this year, the biggest deer that I've had to this point is like a one maybe he'd go high teens like you know maybe between 115 and 120 as an eight point he's still in full velvet so it's a little bit deceiving right now he probably looks like a 120 inch buck but you know he, he's gonna lose that velvet here in the next couple weeks and he's gonna look he's gonna look a lot different so I'm thinking he's gonna look maybe mid one teens or something but I anticipate in the next 10 days to two weeks to see a whole different crop of deer on these cameras. That's how it's been for me in the past. And I don't know why it would be any different this year. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I did, you know, in the past, I, I was the same way run cameras all year. Like I felt like I needed to have cameras out there. I don't know if it was so much of like, it made me feel like I was in the game or doing something. But looking back at it now, and, and I've grown as a deer hunter in the last, you know, five to eight years, so much leaps and bounds, like quicker than I probably grew, you know, from when I could start to till that point, you know, because of, I, I don't want to blame it on, I'm in the 
the TV world. That's what I do for my job. You know what I mean? Um, but like growing up, I don't want to blame it all on that, but you, you grow up and you watch the real trees and the primos and the, you know, the monster bucks and stuff like that. And, you know, you feel like you need to be putting in food plots and you need to have those cameras and you need to have like inventory on deer that, uh, year after year, you know, like, that's cool. Like you need to, like, that's the standard almost like, that's what I felt like. But like I said, um, that's just not realistic where we're at, (laughs) you know, it it, it doesn't translate. No, no, it doesn't. And to go back to what you were saying, you've never really benefited off of in, or, you know, trail cam data from earlier on. And it kind of made me think of a couple deer that here in Michigan that I, that I have benefited on, You know, two bucks in particular um, that I shot with my bow, but I didn't start picking up on those deer until end of August on camera, but I did run cameras all year, but uh, I shot one on October 1st, and then I shot the other one on October 18th, Um, and I had a picture of the the October 18th deer on August 18th. Uh, It was the first picture I got of him, figured he was in like this bedding area spot, Move the stand in and killed him that night. Um, the other one was I uh, had pictures of him on the other side of the farm. All, all you know, from August. It was early August, I think, or mid August until September, end of September. Um, and then he moved to the other side of the farm. And I think I just ended up getting lucky, to be honest with you. That that mm-hmm. was where he kind of transitioned when his velvet came off. Um, but I had strategically st- placed stands you know, on the edge of some bedding on some transition to food. And I, th- I just think he, you know, like I said, transitioned to that spot and that's where he liked it. But those are the only two, man. I mean, it, but year after year, I felt like I needed to have those out there. And like you said, you know, you have, you probably ran like 10 cameras last year. I've got uh, one, two, three, I've got four cameras out right now on two farms and like the batteries are dead on two of them. And like, I don't even like, I've been so busy, but I don't even feel like I need to go. I don't want to go in. I, you know, I do not want to go in. I'm so close now. I've made it this far. It's like, just let it go. You know, um, I'm switching up how I hunt a little bit this year. Like I know you're a mobile hunter. I'm on my family farm. I'm going strictly mobile. Uh, we, we did hang a couple stands for like morning spots, where I just know it's going to get to the point where I just don't want to hang a stand in the morning. Um, and there's some good morning spots that we're hanging stands on, but for the majority, like I'm going to run and gun and like, and I, I, and I'm excited to do that. I don't know if I'm going to hate it, (laughs) but I want to try it, you know? Yeah, Um, for sure, man. That's a, that's an awesome topic uh, that we should talk about. I did want to just before we, I get too far, I forget. I want to just say I have lost track of time. And when I'm saying I don't start running my cameras till now, I'm honestly thinking now is still the end of August, okay? Yeah. (laughs) So, uh, you know, basically when the calendar turns from August to to September, uh, that whole month prior to our opener, which is the 1st of October, if I can get four weeks of intel, I feel like I'm totally in the game. Everything before that now, for a, a, a trail camera enthusiast or for those who have great spots to set them out and get really good velvet photos, I mean, the, it's the probably the funnest time of year to run cameras. You get some beautiful, beautiful photos because the deer just, well, they're out feeding, they're relaxed, they're growing. It's, it is some super cool stuff, but I'm just talking. If I'm, And that's the other thing here in Michigan, a lot of deer get hit by cars, man. Oh, like, yeah. That is something that I have really noticed running a lot of cameras is like the amount of deer that change over is ridiculous like you know between winters predators the hunting pressure the auto collisions deer don't deer don't live long lives typically here in michigan and i see a lot of change over which i think keeps whitetail hunting really interesting too because I just feel like the deer change a lot. I don't know, deer, different areas have different kind of attitudes. And I notice the different deer up north in northern Michigan and the big woods than down down here in the south. And I don't know, that's uh, something that I've 
paid attention to the last couple of years a lot too, just how different the deer act. But yeah, mobile hunting is the, is the, you know, kind of the one tool that you can take everywhere and it's going to get you, it's going to get you right in the game. And the, if your objective is to, and this is thing that I think makes it super simple. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to bring deer to you? Or are you trying to go to deer? Because if you're trying to go to deer, it's a lot easier, in my opinion, and more effective than sitting back and waiting for them to come to you and try to manipulate something to, it's like, I, I enjoy going strategically on the offensive with mobile hunting gear. And that's just the most fun way to hunt. You see a lot of different, you know, if we're talking state land up north. I mean, my gosh, man, it's like every time it's like you're bought a new piece of property. You know what I mean? For sure. uh, Looking at different trees, man. (laughs) Yeah. I I know that people do have giant tracts of land, but I mean, not the normal, the normal guy. So if you're just into, uh, you know, exploring and that kind of stuff too, like, gosh, it's just, I don't know how you can replace it. Mobile hunting, public land here in our state is just ridiculously fun, especially with the integration of Western gear. You know, using outstanding garments and layering systems and using high quality frame packs and packs that carry carry weight real well and having your setup like set up is uh, and we have the luxury here in Michigan that we don't typically have to trek in, you know, you're hard pressed to go what in the lower, I think, you know, two miles from a road. I think at any point in the lower uh, you're like within two miles of a road somewhere. Yeah. Or three, two or three miles. It's not very far. Okay. Now some of those miles can be nasty to cover and you can go out and hike. I mean, there's just, there's going to be a gas line or an easement or a road, a river, something of that sort, but there's a ton of land and you can just go and go and go just cause you come to that road. That's nothing. I mean, you might use that road for, part of your trip or where you're going or whatever and cut some access but uh yeah man it's just so much fun i could not imagine i couldn't imagine doing it and like i was saying earlier we live in just an awesome time i mean the gear selection is just ridiculous with the mobile hunting options and kind of the influencers that are out there like john eberhardt and dan Infall. i don't i don't i, I say influencers i mean they kind of are educators they've been doing these things for for decades and then they share all their information it just cuts the learning curve down and for sure and i feel like guys like you and i and the younger guys that are like even into a little bit of tech you know apps on our phone gear like uh i feel like our generation is really into gear so you take those guys knowledge and then the knowledge that's just a, uh, available in the high quality equipment. Super exciting time to be a deer hunter. And uh, when that is really what reshaped my attitude was that whole thing of like getting set up to go, just go anywhere, man. Like have a backpack and a tree stand and a way to climb a tree. And that's all you need. You just throw that in your truck and you're like a homeless person, you know, <laughs> for, for 10 days. And you just go, you call people, you text people, you, you know, you can prod for local information, you build relationships in areas and, uh, just get little tips. That's one thing about mobile hunting, man. Talk to people and get tips. Like you can just cut so much of a learning curve and find cool spots. And you'd be amazed at how many guys would be like, Oh, you know, yeah, we used to have a cabin up there. You know, we used to hunt up there, but I haven't been up there in uh, eight years or whatever. But I can tell you an awesome place to go where we see a ton of deer. It's like, please do tell, you know, let's talk. Can I get your next beer? You know what I mean? And uh, that's part of the thing, too, in Michigan, you know, the hunting culture. If you're talking about the great people, you can get just a ton of valuable information and be on your way to having the most fun you've ever had deer hunting. Yeah, I I agree 100% on that because – you know, the mobile, the mobile thing, like you kind of go back to like the John Eberhardt's and the Dan Infaults, like I, you know, they learn from, from someone, you know, they, but back in their day, like when they were, you know, our age or even a little bit before when they were coming up, like they didn't have all the nonsense that we have 
that like might run them thin other ways. You know what I mean? Like John, like he hunted out of a tree stand for not very long and then found this sling and was like, but no, he didn't really probably see any other way of going, you know, growing up for me anyway, it was like, I grew up, you hang a stand and that's the stand you hunt. Like you don't move around. Like that was just the, how we did it. And then as I got like out of high school into college and started like diving deeper and deeper. And then when I, you know, came on with Chris and Casey, like Casey, I wouldn't say we're, I wouldn't call him a mobile hunter. I would call him a hunter that gets mobile when he needs to. You know what I mean? Like we'll sit from afar and glass and glass and glass and watch a deer do something and then we'll go in for the kill. You know, but really you can do that in Michigan, but it's it's just we have more time when we're out there doing it like in Kansas, Illinois. We're there to do it, you know, so yeah. it's like not everybody has that time. Um like the deer I killed in Iowa last year, I sat in one stand overlooking this farm for six days, found a deer that was doing the same thing, you know, two days in a row, moved in, killed him the next day. I wouldn't yeah. call that's running gun. We don't go in with the stand on our backs and hang it and hunt it. Sometimes we do. We have, you know, in the past, but we usually get some intel and then do it. Like what I mean mobile hunting is like, you're exclusively doing that. You're ripping your stand down when you get done hunting and you're going to hunt, you know, tomorrow in a different spot, you know, or something that to me is like mobile. So that's, you know, that's what I'm looking to do. And like you said, you know, it's like you're hunting a new piece of property every time, you know, my family farms, 215 acres. And there's probably, I'd say half of it that I've never hunted before in my life. And my dad's been hunting it since the seventies. It's the only farm. Like when I started growing up, that was the only farm that I hunted ever, yeah. you know, and there's half of it. I wouldn't say maybe half just, I mean, it's close that I've never hunted. And this year, you know, I'm, I don't have, I don't get a lot of time to hunt because of my job and everything. But I was just telling a buddy today, I was like, you know, I'm kind of a more passive hunter. You know, I like to sit back and, and, and kind of let the deer come to me, you know, either on a destination plot or a, a food source or, you know, a scrape or something. No, not anymore. I'm, I'm getting in the game. I'm going, you know, and it's something that I've been kind of trying to wrap my head around. It's that fear of kind of failing. That's why I feel like I'm more of a passive. Like I don't want to blow a deer out. Like I feel like if I kicked a deer, he'd be gone forever. You know, so I'm kind of throwing that to the wind. I'm not saying I'm going to go in guns a blazing, running through the timber. I'm going to be smart about it, but I'm going to get in deeper. If I was setting up usually before 100 yards from the bedding, I'm going to try to get in a little tighter, maybe 60 yards, you know, and just, you know, play in the wind still. But, you know, I, I just want to get in the game more. And every sit, I'm going in to kill. Like there is no more sits like, you know, I'm going to wait and see how this plays out. I'm going in. I'm going to kill. You know, why not? Let's try it. And that, I think I need to fail. I want to fail because I'm kind of scared of failing, I feel like, but I want to learn. That's going to teach me, you know, so let's do it. Like, I'm ready to go, if that makes sense. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like you're all jacked up on Mountain Dew. I, I am, Chip. Let's go. <laughs> uh, you know, the mobile hunting thing, it's a sliding scale, right? Everybody's hunting mobile in some capacity you know the guy that hunt has one shack and that's all he goes to he's like the opposite side of the scale versus a guy that has like you know four mini sticks and some ultra light hang on or is running a saddle i mean guys go to some pretty extremes right now but you know you could argue the guy that has four blinds that he goes to is more mobile than the guy that has one and then maybe every now and then that guy goes sits in a ladder stand uh, for years. I mean, we grew up just brushing in blinds. I mean, that is how we grew up was picking up deadfall and building deer blinds out of them. Like, this looks like a good spot. Let's build a deer blind. And then we'll sit there, you know. And so the whole mobile hunting thing comes in a whole lot of different levels and everybody evolves to uh, a different spot. I mean, some of the most successful old-timer deer hunters just go sit on 
you know, go sit on stumps or just essentially they'll still hunt, you know, they'll just get to a spot and kind of stand still and take a step every now and then and work through a real small area. And I know a lot of old timer deer hunters that have shot a lot of big deer in that manner. Cause they're like mobile hunting. They're like, you're not mobile hunting. You're sitting down. <laughs> you know, right. he's like, I never, I never even sit down. I'm like, yeah, yeah touche. You know, I guess you kind of got me, you kind of got me there. So it just is a sliding scale, but it, you kind of think about it, or I, I, I think about it like, uh, or I, um, in the comparison to ice fishing, like the guys that have real elaborate shanties and go out there and they're real comfortable, they probably on average catch less fish than a guy that's willing to just go drill holes for endless amounts of time and sit on a bucket and just rip fish out and move and rip fish out and move like at the end of the day because that guy's mobile and he keeps a pack light and it's not a headache for him to move he's moving a lot getting out the fish and i feel like that's the same thing with deer hunting you know if you do build a blind or you go through all this work to hang a stand you kind of have this little emotional attachment to the work that went into it and you want to reap those rewards but if you just carry your stand on your back and have a I go in the in the spring or this time of year. Now, now I started going just the beginning of September, I think, is my favorite time to go. And I think that might be now because I know the area is a little bit better. So I, I don't – I feel like I've already done spring scouting enough times in these areas. And I, I'm talking about being on a working man schedule where I might only have one opportunity to burn – a three day weekend on a scouting trip all year. So I've got to utilize that time. And I like going up this time of year and just checking out where it's happening and where it's not and finding the right tree. And I just mark everything out on X, uh, where I park and the best route in and out, because it, like you said, going in in the morning, we all know that can suck if you don't know exactly where you're going or what's going on. You're trying to set a stand in the dark. It's uh, good luck finding the same tree when you're hunting, <laughs> yeah. hunting out, you know, 250,000 acres of timber, and you're going to find this exact tree. Now, Onyx is pretty spectacular about getting you literally to the where the I, I, I'm. I apologize. If you, I believe you, <laughs> you probably have or are involved with another application that does these similar features and may even be better. I will say that I've been an Onyx user for a long time, and I only think that they've just cluttered the app up with a bunch of stuff that I don't really use. So uh, I know there's other options that guys like differently. I've just always had that one, and it does the basic things, which I need to do is mark yep. where I park, mark where I park. Uh, mark my travel route in and out because also going in and out of the dark, I want to know exactly. I'm strategic about my routes in and out in coordination to deer approaching my area. And the big woods deer will tolerate none of that. Like human intrusion through their travel pattern. That is not, I mean, they're going to freak out. Yeah. And so I'm planning my exact boot steps, basically. And sometimes, in some cases, I'm even, because I have to get to a tree where the wind is going to favor me in this area, I'll have to jump across a deer trail. And I will literally do that. Like, I will have that deer trail marked on that app as well. When I get to it, you know, it'll, it'll, yep, there it is. And I'll remember, you know, to just take a nice long jump over that because uh i've just seen a lot of times where they got their new nose glued to that trail and if you were to put a boot track on it they're going to stop and they're going to kind of panic and freak out and they're they're not going to be happy and they're not going to hang around whereas if you jump that trail that'll be enough where if it's a buck cruising and he's just got his nose right to that trail and he's moving if it doesn't catch his eye and it doesn't catch his nose for that brief second that he plows through there that is enough to not interrupt that. So I love having my trail just like fine tuned in. And then when I get to the exact tree, I have already been up and down it in some capacity in the daylight to where I know when I get up there, I have clear lanes that I'm not just getting up there wasting a sit. Cause I did that too many times when I started, it was like, Oh, I just, I know I got to go in here in the dark and 
try to hang in the complete dark. And if it's just really hard if, for me. I've had real low success getting up into a tree in the dark and it coming to light and being like, oh, well, that sucks that that's there or this isn't really going to work. And now I'm just feeling like anxious, like I'm ill prepared and I need to move. So when I go out, I go out with my stand and I scout and I go up these trees. If I've got an ox and dead fall down, I will. Um, I take a little bit, a little pair of nippers. I won't clip anything bigger than my pinky. I know it's illegal, but I'm just being honest with people here. Um, if I, I always go about it in a manicuring way where I feel like I leave the woods looking better than it looked before I got there. So that's how I justify it, I guess, to myself. But I won't clip anything bigger than my pinky. And if I got to clean a couple little branches here and there to have some shooting lanes, I'd rather have an ethical kill on a deer than hitting a limb and turning my hunt into an absolute disaster. So, and I'll put uh, a diamond of tax at eye level on that tree, just, you know, so that basically if you're not walking straight onto it, you just can't miss it. You know yeah. what I mean? You can see it from a hundred yards away with the red headlink on. Yep. And uh, I'll do that. And then also when I get up there, I'll put a tack at where the base of my stand goes. So I know exactly the spot where my stand was when I was up there where I could see exactly perfect. Cause I've got that wrong a couple of times too, where you just six inches or a foot difference. And you're like, Oh my gosh, you know, I got to literally move this thing six inches or a foot like yeah. for it to be perfect. So and I that just can make a big it. difference too. Yeah, so I just started putting a tack right where the elevation for the base of my stand goes. And that's been a bulletproof approach for me for going into spots, you know, in the morning, in the dark. It's just like, hey, I know the wind's going to be right. I haven't been in there. I know there's going to be deer in there. It is the all, you know, and then even if I go in September, I'm not going back. We're talking typically this is in. The, I usually don't get up there until November. I hunt a rut up there. So, right. you know, two and a half months has gone by for one time going in there. I mean, it's just, uh, I feel like it's a pretty, pretty good approach. And I, I've been enjoying the hell out of it in the last couple of years. Now I started to get to where I have like half dozen, like real good spots. And that, now it's just fun and exciting because I could take other guys with me and be like, oh, yeah, I can get, you know, get your buddies. When we all do that, you know, we, we're the group, the camp, the guys that I hunt with, my good hunting buddies, the, the three of us, really the four of us, three guys, plus myself, all hunt in this similar same manner and then compare notes and take each other uh, our spots and, hey, it'd be sweet if one guy, like, past this place going in if you want to sit it and go you know go together man you want to talk about building a bond with your buddy you just go trek into the woods and mobile hunt some whitetails in northern michigan and it's, it's oh man it's the thing dreams are made of it definitely i can attest to that my dad and i actually tag teamed um a couple years ago on a buck we knew he was in this bedding area and we had two sets that were already on each side of it and the wind was good for both and we were like you know, let's go to these two stands. Literally, they were only probably 125 yards from each other. I mean, if one of us would have shot, we probably would have heard the other one. And uh, I was, I told him as we're walking in, I'm like, one of us is going to see this buck tonight. I almost guarantee it. And either we're going to see him or we're going to get a shot at him. And he ended up coming out on my side and with a doe, trailing a doe. It was November 2nd, trailing a doe, and he bedded at 70 yards with a doe facing me uh the whole night three and a half hours bedded there never moved right before dark she got up like i'm trying to figure out how i can get out of my stand like how can i get down and maybe stalk this thing like it was just not happening um but it was one of those things it was like you know we knew we knew he was gonna be in there like it, it was just we had good intel on him there, and we just knew one of them, one of us was going to see him. And after that was kind of a, like a light bulb thing, like, man, that's that was fun. Like, my dad and I are texting in the tree, like, hey, I got him right in front of me right now. And he's like, you know, 
let me know if he comes my way kind of thing. Like, um, you know, it was just cool to, and you learn a lot, you know, we knew we had him surrounded and, um, I, I definitely agree. I've got a question for you though. And it's something about, I'm going to go back to a little bit when I was talking about, you know, I was worried about blowing deer out. You know, that's something I've been hearing on podcast this last couple months, you know, and one in particular that I was listening to was Mark Kenyon's when he had Andre DeQuisto on and he was talking about how he just does not worry about blowing deer. You know, he's like, that deer will be back. He, you, you don't blow him out. So my question to you is like, when I'm hearing that, I'm like, okay, you know, I take that, I retain it. But then I'm like, he's hunting Illinois. I'm hunting Michigan. How far do you listen to that? You know what I mean? Like, so my question to you is like, when you hear that from a guy, whether it be Andre or whoever, maybe they hunt, you know, Illinois, Iowa, Ohio, whatever it is, like how, how much are you looking into that? Um, they hunt Iowa. Yeah, Iowa. Uh, sorry. Yep. Iowa. Yeah. They've got a great, they got a great farm uh, by all accounts of the people that I, associate with and talk with that uh, have a good relationship with those guys that they've got just an outstanding farm uh, out in Iowa. I, I think it's awful advice personally for guys that hunt like me and you do that hunt pressured deer. Uh, pressure dictates everything. Like the way that deer act in an area and on a farm that those guys hunt that, I mean, they literally own that piece of property. That piece of property exists to deer hunt. Yep. So those deer have, they have less pressure than would ever naturally exist for the most part because the food is put there for them. They've essentially had this little utopia to have no stress and be giant. Now they still have rough winters and they're hardy animals that live in terrible environments. But my point is you're hunting them in the most pristine circumstances that exist. Now those guys have put themselves in that position. And I know that Andre will, will would probably argue that they've done this uh, on different properties and uh, public land and everywhere else i just i'm not really buying it i think it just does damage personally i couldn't see how bumping deer isn't going to make them relocate i mean I, i can understand i think the deer here are smart enough to recognize if you're just some hiker walking through the woods or if they see a person that come has come in and hung a tree stand, like John Eberhardt will tell you, all the bucks he's ever shot have never not had a pre-existing wound. Some have had up to four. So these deer have literally grown up in a combat zone. So when people come around, do they go the opposite direction? And they, they typically don't feel safe coming back unless it would be like some super weird circumstance where you're literally out in the middle of some, unforsaken swamp but if we're it varies big time property to property but if you just had like a a 10 acre parcel or a 15 acre parcel the absolute worst information that i could ever give to anybody be like yeah go in there and let that deer know that you're there and scare him out of his bed like that would be the opposite of what i would ever tell anybody to do in our circumstance yeah and and that's why i'm trying to like (laughs) <laughs> trying to figure out how much you look into this and I'm trying to find a guy you know even like yourself you know that or like a John Eberhart you know but John I'm not saying what John does is right or wrong a guy's got a track record better than you know <laughs> just about anybody out there in a pressured state but like John you know he's I, I shouldn't say I don't know he does things I guess I don't know how to put it. John's very in his own way. Intense. Yes, he's in his own way. Hardcore. You know what I mean? He's very, very, you know, I wouldn't say in your face, but he comes across of like, you know, like this is, this is the only way. You know what I mean? Like no, no, they forgot to install the bullshit filter on that model. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. No, we missed that one. I agree, but I, I also think, 
from property to property, what whatever state you're in or county to county or whatever it is, it's going to vary. You know, it's going to vary. Like you go down to southern Michigan, like let's say Jackson County, Van Buren, you know, um, Washtenaw, where all these giants, like, you know, if you, if somebody always asks me, they're like, where, where do the big deer come from Michigan? And I'm like, well, I mean, you can find them anywhere in Michigan, but like year after year, you see them get pulled out of there. You know, those counties, Washtenaw County, I'd put up against just about any county in the country for, you know, big deer, um, or in Van Buren, you know, but that, I would think that those properties are going to vary a little different than properties that you might be hunting or I'm hunting or something like I think in a public land setting. And I don't know, I've never hunted public land. You can attest to it, but like, I feel like deer probably take a little more pressure than maybe something on, on private. I I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. That's why I'm just trying to like discern, you know, differentiate like like where's that boundary at like how far do you push the envelope well all deer have grown up with a different level of pressure and it's it's uh it's like a kid growing up in a neighborhood you know if you have a kid a child a young child that grows up in a high crime neighborhood look at what that kid is at 14 years old versus a kid at 14 years old that grew up in some you know, some wealthy gated uh, community and just doesn't know anything about violence um, and, and fear like these, like these deer do in these high pressure areas. I mean, literally they're six months old and they're basically on their own and people are shooting at them left and right. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, you compare that to a buck that's lived on a farm that's gone five seasons without anybody ever shooting anything at him how different is that animal? I mean, it's just a completely different animal. When those guys say, I don't worry about it. I can just go bump them. Well, yeah, the deer's been bumped before. Nothing in five years, nothing's ever hurt him. So why would he freak out about it? I, I would, I would understand that from his learning curve and perspective, but a deer that's been shot three times, that's two years old is going to really have a lot different tolerance for people being around, in my opinion. Right. And that's why I was saying about when, even now, when the squirrel hunters hit the woods and the bear hunters hit the woods, the deer really, they change a lot according to the pressure. And they do so all season. They move around, which is what's fun about mobile hunting, man, because those deer are always having to make moves here in the state. And uh, you see it seasonally. And once you've hunted these spots for a couple of years, you kind of see the patterns and they redo those patterns for the most part every year. Nothing dramatic has changed on the landscape. Food sources are, you know, the same. Uh, Up north, obviously, a lot of stuff gets cut. So you got to see what's getting cut up north because that'll dictate where the deer are and are for sure. And then basically just through the season, know that especially up there they're going to move they're just going to continue to move into cover but they still need food you know yep. so you get isolated food sources and heavy cover um and the deer will, will oftentimes concentrate to those but that's why i i've always i've spent a ton of time in swamps up there because that's just where the deer that's where the deer end up and i mean man you'd be amazed you'd be a you know, mile and a half out in some middle of some unbelievable thick cedar swamp. And you'd think, man, the only thing that lives out here is big giant bucks, right? Spike horn, you know, <laughs> spike yeah. horn, spike horn. It's like even these year and a half old deer know to follow the other deer here for safety. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I just, I, you know, um, I very much enjoy uh, listening to Andre DiQuisto, uh talk about deer hunting. You know, he's uh, definitely has some pretty stellar, you know, achievements. But that also goes to he's one of the guys that I've heard talk in the past couple of years who says he has a hard time getting up for deer hunting now. Yeah, it's like he's kind of done it. Like he's like, what am I going to do? Shoot another two hundred inch buck? <laughs> right. You know, and and you can't like, fault yeah, him I, for that either. You know what I mean? I like. See, I see how, you know, you've, uh, you get to the end of the, of the rope for the excitement level 
And then I don't know, but you know, like I said, that's the difference. I don't know that I even aspire to own a deer hunting property under any situation. Cause I feel like it would handicap me because that's by nature, just who I am. I would start working on a thing like a madman and I never want to leave it. Right. You get attached then, to it, you get emotionally attached. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, then you're, then you're attached to it and man, it's just nice when hunting season rolls around and just, you're like, man, I got every option basically in the world right now. And then if you get invites to go with friends or whatever, and you have this system kind of figured out, it's like, you're not, don't really have to rely on, is this stand going to be, because dude, I'm super, you know, I'm sure you guys are the same way too. Like if somebody else set your stands up and you got into them, you're like, what's wrong with these people? You know what I mean? <laughs> Why would they do this? Yeah. And so it's nice to just have your stuff and know that you're going to be setting up your own setup and just like I said about the scouting thing, man, I just want to go for a long walk out in the woods and it's awesome to be carrying a bow with you and have some super ultra light uh, climbing gear to be able to just get up in a tree and really, really, I mean, that's the best way to just no tricks, no tactics uh, of trying to bring them in, just ultimate surprise, you know, like deers walked by that tree 600 times this year and uh, never been a problem, and all of a sudden it's a problem. Definitely. I mean, there's a couple of guys, we're talking about Andre here a little bit to go back to that point before I get to where I want to go. Uh, there's a couple guys, when when they talk, it's, it's like my ears perk up and I'm like, okay, I'm going to listen. Like definitely Andre DeQuisto is at the top of the list. Him and Dan and fault. Like I just enjoy listening to those guys talk because they've been doing it for so long and they've done it like their way. Like it's, they don't take any bullshit. It's like, you know, Andre like started, you know, trapping, like he was a huge trapper and that was kind of like how he got out and did it. And then, you know, yeah, he's killed a ton of giant bucks, you know, that which is awesome. Um, really, I don't look at it and like, man, it's like he killed a whole bunch of giant bucks. thing I like to see is he gets consistently on bucks. Like that's that's cool to me regardless of the size. I mean, and that's that's neat to me. You know, same thing with Dan. The thing I love about Dan is like he freaking like goes out in the – the muck in the in the swamps where you're like there's just no way there's deer out there and he'll set up on a on one solitary bed and when he gets up in his stand he can look over the cattails and he sees the buck bedded there and then he waits for him to get up and i mean that is elite level like that is stupid how people can do that and it's so fascinating to me so when those guys when you hear them talk it's like i just love listening to them talk but you know Dan, he, you know, hunts Wisconsin a lot, which they are pressured. You know, I've never hunted Wisconsin. I've been, you know, Casey and I, he's hunted there. I filmed him. Um, and it was like the worst hunting I've ever been around. <laughs> like it was, if we just didn't see a lot of deer where we were at, but you know, Andre grew up in Wisconsin as well, you know, but I just don't know how their pressure equates to our pressure, you know, cause you hear a lot of people saying, well, Wisconsin's the, the same way it's, it's, it's pressured deer, but I know how Michigan is because I'm here year in and year out. But like, how is Wisconsin? I don't. What have you heard or like have you been over to Wisconsin to hunt at all? Yeah, I've spent time at Dan's house. Uh, I've spent time scouting with Dan. I've baited bear with Dan. Uh, I know his neighborhood. I know I have uh, another friend, Sam Ubel, that kind of lives in that area. So I've spent a fair amount of time out there. I used to live in Illinois. I was a contractor out of Chicago, but um, we covered our territory was up to Milwaukee. So I actually spent a fair amount of time in like Northeast Illinois and what would be Southeast um, Wisconsin. And so I know those areas fairly well. And a lot of people that deer hunt there have a lot of big deer on their wall. And more than, you know, I know guys that have deer hunted their entire life here in Michigan, 
I, I just think, and I think the license sales and the amount of people that hunt and per square acre and everything. And I think you can look at just that, like even like Pope and Young and Boone and Crockett entries that come out of Wisconsin versus Michigan. And I think the, the BNC or PNY entries just dwarf what comes out of Michigan. They got some pretty good deer, yeah. and deer hunting yep. over there for sure. So I'll just, man, in complete honesty, I think, uh, John Eberhardt, if you had to just let that guy go, if you just let like all those guys go, put them in different scenarios in different places, I think John Eberhardt out hunts everybody 10 to 1. I'm going to be honest with you. John Eberhardt has killed amazing deer in areas that people do not kill amazing deer, and he just does it. But the guy is literally like robo deer hunter, dude. I mean, he is... He's just a machine. Like yeah. he literally alters his diet so he smells less. <laughs> uh, he he's just to the extreme. You know his vehicle. He drives a minivan because it's the most efficient for deer hunting. I mean he lives out of plastic totes. Yep. He is just he is like a robo deer hunter, and he he can do that and he can have some amazing amazing results. It's just it's pretty ridiculous. I I feel like if you were gonna go to a lot of those guys in Wisconsin's neighborhood and hang out with a bunch of deer hunters in their barns and in their trophy rooms. You're going to see a different caliber of deer than you would if you're hanging out in John Eberhardt's neighborhood at a bunch of pole barns and yep. deer hunters' houses. It's just uh, apples to oranges. And so what John has done is extremely impressive, but don't take that that I'm taking anything away uh, from those guys and especially Dan Infault, he is, you know, out of all the people that put content out, um, there's not very many people that are as much in touch with nature in the woods and as much of a woodsman as Dan Infault is. He is truly a once in a lifetime, uh, person to be able to get information from. And, you know, I, the, it's he's a he's Dan is a different different cat man. He is a, uh, <laughs> he is a different dude. But I tell you what, you want to talk about just having a good feeling, like like feeling like you're just hanging out with an awesome person. Like his energy is uh, contagious when you hang out with that guy, and and he he'd be hard on you if you were uh, his kid. You know he's 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 strict. Like and that's why he's a good deer hunter too. Like if you're doing something that Dan doesn't want you to be doing, he's going to let you know about it. Cause he doesn't want you screwing up what you guys are doing in the woods. Right. But he just jokes all the time and has this great personality and he sees the woods differently. And it's apparent when you look at, you know, you look at his trophy wall and the deer that he has, has killed. I mean, he is just, he's a, a true woodsman man. And a guy that, you know, if you took all the, you know, I was talking about how our generation's big into, you know, if you took our smartphones away, and you took all of our good high quality gear away and you put crappy bows in our hands and we'd be a different kind of deer hunter. And he came up in a different time and did it at a different, um, you know, level of basically difficulty. And he's always pinned the odds against himself and has done most of it on public land. He's a... Uh, amazing amazing person to be able to uh, get all the, and he, else he's probably the least selfish to it for the longest period of time about just putting out information johnny Barr has been amazing about it too both of those guys really are you know it's kind of funny they had a, a little bit of a riff going for a while and uh i feel like i was one of the mitigators in that relationship because i'm friends with dan and john and I told them both, I'm like, it's kind of ridiculous that you guys don't get along because you guys both blast the industry left and right. Like they're, they're, they're just pit bulls about, like, you know, making, you know, basically the, the industry standards and this and that. Um, they both live to deer hunt their utter passion. And I think they're just such competitive people and they, they didn't meet 
at a campfire they met via social media that they instantly just kind of pinned against one another and felt like they were enemies but uh i and a few other guys kind of brokered a relationship talking both of those guys that it would be in their best interest to communicate that they'd really like each other right and then the hunting public guys pulled it off they got them to come um they got them to come to do that that challenge and uh by all accounts dan and, and john talked for a long time and dan told me after that that he had a different opinion about john than he did in the past and hey that's a good guy and i was just like oh my heart's so warm <laughs> right now you know what i mean well, like that's what happens so... when you get like two alphas <clears throat> you know what i mean they're alpha males sure. that are just like you know, it's no different than two wolves, two alpha wolves that are just trying to eat on a carcass. You know, they're yeah. probably not going to get along until, you know, there's no carcass there. And they, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That, that is, uh, that is a very fair, uh, and accurate assessment. And yeah, it was, it was, it was cool to see it happen. But, uh, yeah, man, that, that, that whole thing, that's something actually I'm going to rewatch here, uh, in the next couple of weeks is, uh, that hunting challenge that those guys did here last year in Michigan, because that was a really good piece of information that uh, is available to anybody right now on YouTube to go look for the hat pin. Boy, you want to get jacked up for some uh, early season bow hunting? Yeah, go watch, go 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 watch that right now. That'll get you that'll get you pumped up. And yeah, that was just a cool thing to see those guys come together, come together and do that. You know. I'm talking to Dan and John just because you're talking about a couple guys that really like you like to listen to. And I want to make sure that I make mention of um, the Big Woods Bucks guys, uh, Hal Blood. I don't know if he's someone that you're familiar yep, with. or Definitely. I, yeah, I, I, man. I, I retain a lot of that information as well. <laughs> I love Hal Blood. Uh, number one deer storyteller in the world, in my opinion. Super smart guy. And pertaining to like if you're uh, hunting small parcels of uh, private and public land i don't know how much value you could take away from what they're actually saying but they're still super enjoyable to listen to because they just tell cool cool deer hunting stories about being up in the big woods i mean way off the beaten path up in northern maine and they shoot big giant bucks and, uh, but for Northern Michigan and for guys in the UP, they straight up hunt like that. Right. And, uh, and the uh, Todd Havel is, a uh, another guy that's friends with Dan Infall, who's a tracker and, uh, he lives in Wisconsin and he does some, uh, some hunting in the UP and, uh, yeah, guys go hunt in that manner. And I've learned a lot just from listening to, uh, Hal about you know big deer what they do year in and year out in the big woods and man his information for me has been super valuable and i think those guys are just the salt of the earth too yep there's a couple guys out there like that and i'm, I'm kind of blanking on them right now that I, i'm trying to rack my brain but there's some there's some dudes out there that are are straight getting it done and have at a high level for a long time i mean dan infall and andre you know, it seems like, I mean, I honestly, to be totally honest, with you, I didn't know who Dan Infault was until probably four or five years ago. You know, like I honestly didn't because it was something that I, you know, a lot of his stuff wasn't out there in, in my world. You know what I mean? Like the YouTube really didn't take off, you know, it, just as of late, it, it really has, you know, and a lot more content's being put out there and, and podcasts and stuff like that. But like, I mean, Andre's been one that I've known that I've listened to for a long time. You know, he was like probably one of the ones early on, like when I was in high school listening to his stuff. But, um, but once I, you know, I th honestly think Dan, I, I think I heard him on like Kenyon's podcast or something like that. And I was like, man, who's this cat? Like, I got to figure out who this guy is. And then I just, it took off from there. But, you know, to kind of go back to the hunting public guys, I love what they're doing. Um, I, in that Michigan challenge, I've been watching that recently. Actually, it's funny you say that where they camped is that campground touches my family farms, my family farm on the, on the East end. 
So they were oh, camping nice. right in my backyard because John lives only 10 minutes from me. Um, oh. So John's familiar. He's killed a lot of bucks probably in around my area. Um, but, yeah, so that's that's kind of – I'm rewatching that, and I'm trying to pick up like what – I'm just interested to see where they went. You know, um, I, I don't hunt public land, but I'm just interested to like – you know, is it close to what I'm hunting? You know what I mean? Or, or something like that. I know Ernie and, and Greg, they went a couple hours south of, of there. Um, don't know where, you know, but in Isabella County where I'm at, there's not a ton of public land here. You know, it's all like around sure. it kind of, you know, so. Right. Yeah. You got to drive a little bit. Yep. It's not right out your door. So. Right. Yep. So Same that, with me down here in Southeast Michigan. I mean, I got to drive really an hour to the first kind of piece and we'll we'll see the uh, verdict is out on how decent uh, that'll be because anything within an hour drive is just the pressure is just militarized zone so um well and you're by yeah, the big city though too i mean you got a yeah. lot of over overflow sure. from there as well yep no that's absolutely so, true yeah um we should uh we should try to make a plan sometime to to, to change that and head up and tackle i know it's next to impossible for you given your profession <laughs> yeah but maybe a late season hunt sometime or something like that where you can sneak away for even a, a day or two it would be you know it'd, it'd be fun it'd be fun to do anytime man and i've even got my family we own a deer camp up in the up on us2 um right near rapid river that's got thousands of acres of public land around it and it's a sweet little deer camp. It's called Camp Motel Six, and uh, yeah, that's it's awesome. yeah. And I have not been able up been up the, been able to go up there and bow hunt at all ever. I've never been able to go up there and hunt just because. Man, you might have <laughs> to think about a new career path. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've got a pretty nice job, but I mean, my my life was consumed with sports all through high school, and then in college, I played some. I played baseball, and that was kind of my thing, you know. And I just hunted around here, and then you know, going right from college into the job I have, I honestly just have not been able to, you mm. know, broaden my horizons a little bit. It just it takes time to do that public land thing you know it's it's just not one of those things like i hunt a lot of the private around me because it's it's kind of that comfort level it's within 15 minutes of me i can do work Mm -hmm. there i can do that and it's got good bucks and that's i want to branch out one day one day when i get a little more time so yeah no you got to take advantage of your time i mean that's uh i play that game and i'm just fortunate that you know my parents took us up north deer hunting and we had some property and then that was surrounded by public and we started venturing out from there where it was just you know a little car ride or walk or whatever and then you just basically keep going farther and farther (laughs) you know and then at some point you're just like all right why am i uh why am i staying within this 15 minutes of driving you know in the morning like why don't i look at what's available 30 minutes from here 45 minutes from here and then walk through a piece like that and you're like holy cow this is great you know look at this and so uh i got a couple uh two i went on two pieces of public this year that i would have never stepped foot on you know that i've never stepped foot on uh and now that i'm kind of doing this every time i go places i'll pull up my on action you know if i'm in a new area or whatever i'll just kind of like look to see what's around and what's available to hunt and water you know rivers like um a lot of heavy cover obviously down by rivers so look for river systems within public and then uh transition you know where a lot of different agri or not agriculture but like uh a lot of different ecosystems essentially merge together and put a lot of edge and then add in some structure of water or a little bit of topography and deer kind of use the landscape similarly. And then you just got to go out there and see basically where everybody else is hunting and how the deer are working around them. Cause they often do, you know, guys that are putting up big pop-up lines and ladder stands and whatnot, those deer will change their patterns from that stuff. Just like me and you walking through the woods, we come across that stuff that looks out of place. I feel like the deer, uh, you know, often are the same way. Uh, deer up there move around a whole lot. So a lot of times, 
deer might have not walked through there in a month and actually seen that. It is just total utter surprise, but just getting in there and walking through, walking the transition, finding a ton of deer sign solidifies kind of what you already knew. If you spend a bunch of time looking at maps and have pounded a bunch of miles on public land before, and I'm going into two pieces this year that I've never been on and pretty excited uh as excited about one of them as i've ever been hunt anywhere to be honest with you with the amount of sign big big rubs i mean on like rub lines following small streams way out in public land and just an interrupted area in the fall where people aren't and the deer are using the you know, using the landscape and the cover and everything to move basically where they like to move and went there and found just giant, uh, the size of my thigh, you know, rubs that have been getting rubbed up for what looks like an over a decade, you know, the half the trees carved out yep. <laughs> and you're just like, holy cow, man. And then, you know, from fresh rubs around there and good deer tracks and you're like, we're in the business. So threw some cameras at it and uh, hope to get up there. Uh, at some point this this year, like I said, uh, my my time will come hopefully late November, uh, in just the month of December is kind of what I'm banking on to be able to do my deer hunting. Yeah, well, that's that's sounds like a awesome plan. I hope it <laughs> I hope it you know comes together for you for sure. That's uh, it's exciting though, something new. You know, I mean, I know you've been up there and and you've done that too, but like, it's just there's something for me when I put a camera out in a new spot sometimes. And it's just like you, like you said, you see all this sign and it kind of clicks and you're like, you kind of walk away with the warm and fuzzies. Like, man, I can't, I can't wait to like get back here and, and see what the hell's going to happen. I agree. You know, people often will say to me, aren't you nervous running cameras? You know, out on public land, don't you think they're going to get stolen and kind of in my head, no, because I'm really going to lengths to put my cameras in places where I just don't foresee anyone else coming to this exact spot. I mean, maybe people are going to be in here within proximity, but there's something about this spot that I trust that I did maybe a little more research that is being overlooked. And I, if your camera... If I was not feeling safe enough that my camera wasn't going to get stolen, I wouldn't feel good enough about putting in the effort to really be hanging a camera there. And if it did get stolen, it would just confirm to me that I'm never going to hunt here because there's other people basically in this, you know, in this area. So, and I put my cameras up like one stick and try to, well, I try to walk through where I want the proximity sensor, where I'm foreseeing the deer being in screen and having the most amount of view time so that I can get a look at that deer is because it, it's, it's on a natural pattern typically. Right. So I don't want just the, having my camera at a 90 degree angle to the trail. I usually like to have them on like a 45 or a 60 so that the deer is either walking into or out of frame. So I get a lot of frame time because I run mine in video. And I try to put that camera in a position to where when I walk through either way, it doesn't stick out to me. See, it's on a 45 or a 60 degree off the trail. So it's maybe like not right in my direct line of vision when I'm looking, walking forward and put it up a little bit and you'd be amazed at how many videos I have of people just walking by those cameras and never seeing them. Yeah. They're not sticking out from the tree. They almost kind of blend in a little more. I'll typically go up a stick and just notch out a little spot in like a pine tree or something, which you have, you have to be careful about. I learned the hard way when you get a snowfall, you can have that thing trimmed out, have that camera in there real good and hidden, but you'll get six inches of wet snow and now that camera's just covered in <laughs> yeah. some super valuable data. So you got to kind of gamble there a little bit to cover for uh, giving, giving that up. But, yeah, just having things 
having the things in a position where they just don't stick out like a sore thumb and then basically yeah i feel like i'm doing enough work to where i'm putting that camera somewhere where i'm like there's just no way somebody's gonna find this right like, like i'm burying treasure or i'm hiding treasure that uh, i plan on coming back to you know yep and i haven't lost one yet to be honest with you uh I'll probably lose every single one <laughs> now this year after after talking about it, but it just is uh, the way it is, and I haven't lost one yet. So yeah. knock on knock on the wood. Definitely. Well, man, I, I don't want to keep you too late here. I know we're over an hour and a half into this bad boy. I it's just yeah, good conversation. It's cool. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> yep. I uh, I appreciate you coming out and doing this, man, and. Um, I'm, I, you're for sure going to be at the top of the list. I might be getting a hold of this fall when I'm, you know, motherfucking myself cause I'm mobile hunting and I need some pointers. <laughs> Why is oh, this man. one thing, you know, not working how I want it to work. So you're going to be at the top of the list. Yeah. You don't ever have to, um, impose on me to talk about deer hunting. I was excited to, for us to be able, I mean, we, we, we do, we talk on the phone, um, uh, here and there, um, uh, and staying in contact and basically just met through podcasting and social media, but very much common interests and share a lot of knowledge with one another. And then obviously, you know, I called you for us starting to film our film and you gave me a lot of pointers and I had never even hunted with a camera or a camera arm. And you're the one basically that walked me through like, Hey, you're going to want to set it up like this and try this and gave me a bunch of very valuable information and boy oh boy i'll tell you after that the whole experience you know i just new level of appreciation for (laughs) guys like you and what you do you guys are work super hard and are true artists and see things little details i think that's why a lot of you camera guys are really good deer hunters is because you guys just really pay attention to detail and break things down and are meticulous and I think that carries over and you make a really good hunter. So, yeah, man, I, I appreciate the, the friendship and the opportunity to come on here and and, uh, and talk with you tonight. Yeah, definitely, and I appreciate the kind words on that as well. And I, I actually haven't got to tell you, or maybe I did, but the film was ph- phenomenal. I loved it. Um, Thanks, man. You know, you guys put a lot of sweat equity and time and, and everything into that, and it, it really showed, and it was it was a good film. Um Hopefully you'll be able to do one again if you want to go through the ringer again. I'll tell you, man, it it like you said, it as a camera guy or field producer, whatever you want to call it, I think there's a difference, but not a lot of people do. But uh, you know, being thorough, we have to be thorough. We have to be, you know, a step or two ahead of the our our you know our person that we're filming, our hunter or whatever, because. You know, you got to be one in the woods. You know, it's a double everything when you're scent, movement, everything. Um, you know, so I, I definitely, I had this argument actually a couple of weeks ago with a guy, and I said, you know, in my opinion, a field producer, a camera guy that films hunting shows has to be a hunter. You just can't throw a guy that's never hunted into filming that he could be the best cinematographer ever. You know, I just feel like he's got to know, he or she's got to know how animals move, how they work, how they how they interact, all that to be able to tell, you know, and show the viewer the the the, the point you're trying to get across, the story, you know. So it's kind of funny you bring that up and, um, but yeah, that's, I had an argument with a guy and I was like, you just, you can't, I mean, people do it, but I'm like, I just don't feel like it's, it's not in your best interest, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, man. Well, I'll tell you what, yeah, you want to talk about wanting to do it again. I mean, I certainly do. I just don't know how it's actually, uh, possible. I'm very thankful at this point that I had the opportunity to do that. And I definitely didn't recognize when I got, you know, when I planned it in my head, um, I had no idea. Uh, I had no idea the amount of time and energy and the work that would go go into it. But once we were into it, we were into it. We were committed. And it was just like, this is going to be done. And then lose full time. You know, I, I don't know how, um, 
it actually worked out for me that I actually lost the job early October and was just like, all right, this is my job now. Let's go. And Jordan was <laughs> Jordan was saying the same thing. He's like, you know, it was uh, it was a bummer. I lost a, a job that I thought was going to be something different than what it was. It actually worked out. It was a blessing, complete blessing in disguise. But in in the real time, I was super bummed out about it. And Jordan was just like, hey, man. We got a job to do here. He's like, this is just going to be your full-time gig for a little bit. And I'm like, all right, that makes me feel better. Let's, let's do it. Let's, uh, <laughs> let, let's do that. And he had a flexible work schedule. And so we made it happen. And golly, yeah, I would love to do it again. But yeah. it'll probably be uh, it'll probably be a while. You know, that was a uh, unique opportunity for him in time, too. You know, now he's kind of in the situation that you are where he's a field producer for a group. And so, you know, his faults are just consumed. Yep. Definitely. And so the whole thing kind of worked out in a good capacity. But yeah, uh, I'll take any last minute recommendations you have on any uh, good whitetail films because I've been trying to consume a bunch of deer hunting content lately. And uh, I'll say that the Big Woods Bucks guys have one called Lee. I don't know if you've ever watched that. And then uh, obviously everybody's watched the uh, River Divide. And then I don't know if there's any other ones that you really like that are uh, kind of stand out for whitetail films. Um, honestly, my favorite, and still to this day I haven't seen one better, is The River's Divide with Donnie Vincent and that dear Steve. Um, yeah. That, that film, it, I have it. Uh, I still watch it. I watch it for, I, I'm not going to lie to you, I, I probably watch it before I go on the road in the fall just for – for inspiration, you know, you go back and I've seen it a hundred times, but I still get the same fulfillment out of it. Um, it's just that stuff excites me. Um, honestly, I, I, none really come to the, to my head right away right now, but if I'll, I'll send you some links when I can, when I think of them, but like rivers divide is the only thing I can think of right now. But, um, there's actually, gosh, what was the one? What did you say the one the Big Woods Bucks was called Lee? It's called yeah, it's uh, the, uh those guys up in Maine, the Big Woods Bucks, Lee, and uh, he has cameraman following around on a, on a deer track, and it's a it's a cool, well done film. It breathes real well. I'll say uh, his voiceover, his narration, is really makes the whole thing. I think it was. Uh, really done well that they let the film really breathe and then when he needed to fill in he he did very powerfully and carried a really good story and uh he just has one of, he's an older gentleman with a like a real great voice to be able to be telling your hunting story and yeah to me that was kind of a stick out film and like you said there's just you know, there's not a whole lot i go looking for him and i seem to come up short so yeah i guess if you get anybody that listens to this and has any recommendations send them over to uh my instagram page at deer hunter podcast send me a message because yeah i'm always looking for uh a good deer hunting film to watch i've watched with just like you you know i watch, watch them and rewatch them and watch them and rewatch them and i'm always looking for some new stuff yeah there is one i just th- i just thought of it um have you ever heard of sea bucks Sea bucks, no. Yep, they're big woods. Um, up in God, I want to say it's Maine. I just watched it. It's the Legend of Bigfoot. It's called. I did hear. I heard about this. I heard him on. Did you have him on your podcast? No, nope. He is one that I I'm trying to bird dog though. He was on with somebody. I think he was on with Kenyon. I think. It could be. Okay, so. It, it, go on YouTube. It's Real Tree. I think owns their content. I think, um, but they have a series out. But look, watch the Legend of the Legend of Bigfoot. Um, it's a north northeastern buck. I mean, they take boats in, uh, camp out there. This story, this deer, could be one of the biggest body deer I've seen ever. Um, but it's it's like twenty seven minutes, I think, or twenty eight minutes. It's a really cool story. Great cinematography. Um, that is the one other one I was thinking of. That's a, a really, really cool. Uh, That's a film, huh? Yeah. How yeah. long? 
it's I think it's 27 minutes. It's part of a series. I think they have an episodic series on Realtree's app 365, Realtree 365. Um, it's okay. called C Bucks. And oh god, I cannot remember the guy's name right now. <sighs> I know who you're talking about, and I, I he, if All it was Mark Kenyon, it was Mark Kenyon, and yeah, he I listened to um, tell the, you know, tell part of the story of of that. It's but, it's uh, such a good it's such a good one. I'm gonna check that out for sure. Maybe even possibly tonight. Yeah, I would definitely yeah so yeah i won't i won't keep dragging this on man i appreciate you coming on and doing this uh plug yourself plug everywhere <laughs> where everybody can find your content and everything yeah everything's at deerhunterpodcast.com it's our website uh instagram is where i'm the most active deer hunter underscore podcast facebook deer hunter podcast youtube channel deer hunter podcast and our full length 46 minute featured film from our 2018 um, deer hunting season up in northern Michigan. Just basically tracking around, mobile hunting, camping up in the big woods in northern Michigan. And Jordan Susowitz was the producer that worked on that with me. And that's on our it's on our YouTube channel. Uh, it's also available on our website. We have uh, DVDs that Jared Scheffler from Whitetail Adrenaline helped us make. And so if you want to get a hard copy of it to have it at your deer camp, that option is uh, available. And I strongly do recommend and suggest that because I feel like it's a good deer camp video. I know a lot of guys bought it to take it to their camps and we got a lot of really nice compliments. So that's why that option is available. And then, you know, it's uh, it's on, on YouTube. You can put it right on YouTube TV and watch it. And uh, it's uh, the camera gear that you guys use now is ridiculous. It is uh, <laughs> it is an utter crime to watch these pieces that you guys are putting together on a smartphone or a tablet or something. Because uh, we have a, a projector now, a hundred inch, ten eighty projector, and watch these deer hunting films, and it is man, it's next level. You know, to see <laughs> yeah. something something like that. Uh, on there is just a totally different experience so if you have that opportunity to put it on a big screen that's where those that's where all these masterpieces like guys like you and jordan and all these top tier producers are uh you know you should be watching the deer hunting content well, cool man that's awesome appreciate right, you man, appreciate you yeah yeah for sure good talk you uh you stay good out there and uh good luck man this this fall i know i'll be talking to you and and picking your brain so thank you very much sounds good aaron i hope you and all your listeners have a outstanding uh deer season everybody be safe and uh enjoy your time feel all right there you have it another great episode thank you to kevin for coming on um check out his deer hunter podcast content uh you can download his podcast anywhere you you know consume your podcast and uh him and his buddies over there got a great thing going he's got good guests on um i love what he's doing over there check out his film as well we talked about that it's a really cool film talking you know hunting northern michigan bucks and public land big public land so that's really cool uh i'm gonna say it here guys go to itunes and leave a five-star rating for the podcast i'd really appreciate it leave some feedback um you can leave it anonymous if you want nobody has to know that it was you just leave something in there i appreciate it um also go to our social channels facebook and instagram like them share them if you want if you don't like it i guess just forget about it ever even happened you don't even know anything about it but i appreciate it so like i said i appreciate it i just i'm just an appreciated person i guess does that make sense anyway go and subscribe everything thank you guys very much (sighs) long-winded and also good luck this fall again so i had to reiterate that get out there be safe and be ethical so Talk to you guys later, and thank you.